what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, I'm going to focus by start off by talking about what civil military relations means in a U.S. context. Um, then I'll give some experience, some of my experiences in Africa, particularly the countries that I, I lived and served. And then I'll talk a little bit about the end about what whether the Western notion of civil military relations, how it applies, how I think it applies to Africa. And then, um, you know, some of the, a lot of the other things I really look forward to the question and answer, because I think that um, I think that's where we get some valuable discussion. So with that, why, I think the first question is, why do we talk about civil military relations? And, uh, and, and Dr. Allen did a good job of laying it out in the very beginning, but I, I want to at least acknowledge up front the, the paradox, and that is that the purpose of a military, the military is designed to protect the interests of the state. And it, but in order to do so, it needs to be strong enough to protect it. But by but it also in that same manner, it can't, by. it can't be so powerful that it threatens it. And I think that's the that's the inherent paradox. So the real question is, you know, how is how do we establish civilian control of the military to to create a, a military that can protect the state? But at the same time, is not so, that has a culture and an ethic that prevents it from overthrowing the state. And in the U.S., when we talk about civil military relations, um, I'm going to talk about it in two levels. One is uh, institutional, and the second is individual. At the institutional level, when we say civilian control, what, what does that mean? As Dr. Allen said, I spent 30 years as a military officer. What, what civilian control means, the president of our country is the commander in chief. The president as the civilian is the, is the, the ultimate authority. Our, our uh, secretary of defense is the civilian. In, our, in the office of the secretary of defense, many of the, the senior leaders that work in the policy and planning across the Pentagon are uh, civilians. Many are uh, career civilians. Many are political appointees. But there's a, they're the first part of what we talk about when we say civilian control. The second portion, and I think this is really important, is that what, when I think of civilian control, especially as a military member, um, it's you know the the phrase that has been used is called an unequal dialogue. And I want to talk about both both those a bit. Unequal. By unequal, we mean it's it's not a majority. The civilians are in control. And uh, the simple example I would give you would be if the Secretary of Defense um, calls in the, the chairman of the chiefs, uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, calls in all the service leaders and wants to discuss a policy and if every single person in the military room is in favor of a certain policy, the Secretary of Defense says, you know, I understand your point. I want to do this. That's what we mean by unequal. Civilian control, civilian decision. What's important about this, though, is the dialogue part. The dialogue part is what makes, is what makes it effective. The dialogue part means we expect the military, while subordinate to civilian control, we expect the military and our military leaders to engage in constructive dialogue with the civilian leadership, provide their military perspective, provide it in, in a way that tells them that it's your best military advice. And if, and if it's not agreed with, then you can go ahead and at the same point, we expect the military then to execute orders uh, you know, without question. So I think that's an important concept to understand what we mean when we say unequal dialogue. The third part is a professional military. And I, and I, don't, and I can't understate the importance of this. In order for civilian control to work, in order for this unequal dialogue to work, the, what underpins it is a professional military, a, a, an officer corps, NCO corps, soldiers, that have a culture of understanding civilian control that comes through being a, a professional. 
I'm not going to talk too much about the importance of a, of, a, of a military professionalism. I know tomorrow that's your session for tomorrow. Um, and it's going to be a, it's going to be a great session. But I think that's what we mean. And when I think of a, a, a profession, it's not just expertise a professional. We're not talking about the ability to employ the military to do your tactical job. We're talking about the character piece, the ethical piece that the, the, the portion of military professionalism makes you want to serve honorably in, a, in support of your country. And I, and I think a general way to, to think about this in some ways, when you think about a professional military, this is simplistic. But it's helpful. Do uh, when the when the citizens of a country see their military, do they run to it, or do they run from it? And very simple, um, but it's, the answer should be should be obvious too. And uh, and that's I think that's a good way to think of it. Now at the individual level, when we think about civilian, you know, so I talked about on the U.S. side, we have the institutional and the individual. Uh, the individual lies as part of the the professional piece, and that's it. The, the U.S. military spends a lot of time training its officers, in particular, but also its soldiers when they come in, about the importance of civil military control and the importance of being a professional. And again, you're going to go into much more duty uh, detail on that on that tomorrow. But um, you know, I I myself went to the United States Military Academy. I showed up at West Point as an 18 year old, and um, I was just a regular citizen. And you know, from, from day one, West Point talked about their motto was duty, honor, country. And inside of that, you know, as an 18 to 22 year old, there was a what West Point was trying to build, not just a not provide not just a, a college education, but build character of of for people that would be future officers in their military. And it's that character piece that serves as the backbone. Because um, civil military relations is, is kind of e it's it's easy when it's when it's easy, you know it's uh you know it's when it's uh when it's you know when, when it's you know when it's sunny out, most people are you know it's easy for people to be happy, but it's when it gets a little when it gets rainy when things get tough, is when uh the, the character part matters, and that's why I think the 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 the, the backbone of effective civil, civil military control is uh, establishing a professional military. Um, one thing else, now what I'm going to talk next about is a little bit is my experience uh, in Africa. So the the first country I served in, I, I lived in Chad for three years. I was in Chad from 2004 to 2007. Um, in, in Chad, President at the time, uh, then, it was pre then President Debbie was the president. He had taken over uh, the presidency uh, via a coup. And, and Chad was in constant turmoil. While I was there, the, um, there was an attempted coup. My family actually got evacuated from and when rebels came in in Jemina. And I emphasize this because the security environment in Chad at the time um, was such that the military, while extremely effective, um, you know, I, I would not label them uh, necessarily a professional military in the sense that they are. Uh, their, their main focus was, and it was understandable at the time because of um, the, the constant threats from uh, ethnic threats from across the border, their, their main focus was was projection, was protecting the regime. Um, and, I, and I think I emphasize this point because you know, Dr. Allen was talking a little bit about coups and we'll talk about how all African countries are, you know, there's their stories a little bit different, but um, once a coup takes place, I mean, and, and coups take place for numerous different reasons. Um, you know, often it surrounds, you know, you know, different things that, you know, I'll come back and talk to you later. But, you know, a coups are, coups are often, a, they're, they're a, a symptom of instability. And so once, you know, and, and so once coups take over, even, even if, even if well-intentioned, it's really, really hard for, uh, you know, for the coup leaders to put in place the kind of things that they they ostensibly say they would like to put in place. Then the next country I'll talk a little bit about is, is, is Tanzania. So I went to Chad from Tanzania, and I know I have some Tanzanian brothers and sisters in the audience. Um, and, you know, and I, and I, I want to highlight these examples because Tanzania was a very different scenario. 
Tanzania was a, you know, a country that continues to have uh, democratic transitions. Um, the, the Tanzanian military is extremely professional. Uh, the, the, when the, the, the Tanzanian, it's, the military is, is named the Tanzanian People's Defense Force, and there's an emphasis on the people side of it. And, uh, and you know, and, and I think it, it, it showed in the way, it showed in ways that the Tanzanian military viewed the people. It showed in the way that the, the, the people viewed the, the Tanzanians. The TPDF, if, if I remember correctly at the time, the TPDF would, uh, would travel to and from work on public transport free. They traveled in a uniform. It was expected. The citizens saw them as part of, of their country, doing good things and helping and supporting the country. Um, I, I can remember once actually having a conversation with the chief of defense where his challenge, he was a little bit frustrated because the, the TPDF was responding to a, um, a, a massive flooding that had taken place and people had lost their homes and they needed some engineer equipment and they, they called the military to try to help. And the military went to help, but they lacked some of the equipment because the military is designed to fight wars and didn't have all the equipment they needed. But my, my point being the people of Tanzania, I think saw the, T, they did not run from the TPDF. They ran to the TPDF. The TPDF took that as a, a source of pride. Then, the last country I worked in was Liberia, and Liberia is a, a little bit, a little bit of both. As I talk about Chad and Tanzania, um, when I was in Liberia, I was in Liberia from 2013 to 15, so about 10 years after their civil war. Um, and you know, Liberia was a, a, a fantastic place to be at that time. What I would like to emphasize with Liberia is that the, the Minister of Defense right now, um, who is now a civilian, and the, the Chief of Defense right now. Uh, I, was, I was honored to be able to become friends with these two young men as they were working to join their military or, or reform their military. So the, the 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 current chief of defense was was friends with the with the the minister. The minister was a civilian, and when he when he talked his friend into joining the military, because his friend didn't want to join the military, he said, "I can't join the military. The military, why would I join the military? The military is bad." And the chief of defense point was, hey, if we're going to make it better, our country needs the military to be better. And if we're going to make it better, we need people like me and you to join in. Now, the current chief of defense had a military background. His father had been in the military. And uh, I, I emphasize this story because the minister of defense, when he joined, he didn't even tell his mom. He was embarrassed to tell his mom because he thought his mom would not let him join. Because at that time, the military had a reputation of being the kind of military that citizens ran from the former Liberian military by the time he was growing up. And now, although the armed force of Liberia is very small, under the leadership of these two men, you know, their motto is a force for good. Uh, and I would tell you that uh, they've totally changed the way the citizens see the military from what they did in, in the Civil War. Okay. You know, I, I promised uh, Dr. Allen I'd be on time, and um, I'm I'm running a little tighter, so I'm going to try to be a little bit quicker here towards the end. I, the last thing I'd like to talk a little bit about is um, do Western notions of civil military relations and professionalism apply in Africa? And I, and I think the answer is it's a resounding yes. I think the ideas of of duty, honor, loyalty, you know, love of country. Those aren't Western notions. Those are, those are, you know, those are ideals that are shared by people, you know, across the world. Establishing a culture that supports them takes time, and I'll make one analogy here that it's imperfect, but I, but I think it's I think it's appropriate. I think it's worth listening to, and that's that. In the in 1860, the United States, 85 years after our independence from Great Britain. We fought a civil war. And when we, saw, when we fought a civil war, West Point classmates, the national military, when, when the Southern states started seceding, Southern officers that were part of the, the national military, they, they quit. They, they left the national military and they went and joined their states to fight the civil war. And, and my, my point here is that even though it was 85 years after our independence. The United States of America 
was more a loose confederation of, of states than it was a real United States. And uh, there's loyalty to states versus loyalty to the nation. In Africa, and each country is different, but in Africa, in many places, you're, you're really only 60, 60 years or so for most countries into your independence. You're still going, and many countries are still going through some of these growing pains of state formation that the United States did, you know, that led to our civil war. So the challenges are out there. Um, and, but, it, but I think the idea of forming a state, developing a professional military are the kind of things that can actually help, uh, help create that, that national unity.